Well, welcome. Today we have a good friend coming back. One of the very first people we had on that started the Medical Review Show. And I can say, your show, we got more email than any other show we've ever had and more questions. <laughs> so why don't we start with introductions? That sounds good. I try to do a better job of answering these questions, I guess, this time. My name is Peter Orio. I'm the Medical Director for Dana Faber Brigham Women's Cancer Center. And we have one here in Milford. And uh, we'd like to, you know, just come on the show and talk a little bit about what we can do and maybe talk a little bit about prostate cancer as well. My name is uh, Benjamin King. I work with uh, Dr. Orio here um, at the Brigham Women's Dana Farber Cancer Center as well. So before we get into, you know, prostate cancer, because again, it was amazing how many people had questions sure. that enjoyed the show, but of course it was always a friend of mine has this question, can, you know, who do I go to? Right. And luckily with the Farber right here, it was easy to refer them mm -hmm. to all the support. But why don't we start, Peter, with, if you were to describe what you're doing here in Milford, how would you do that? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole goal is to basically make sure that we're keeping all the standardization of everything we're doing at the main campus, the Dana Farber in Boston, Brigham Women's in Hospital in Boston, and we're trying to translate everything to Milford. And so we're radiation oncologists, so we use radiation to interact with cancer cells to try to destroy them. And essentially, it's a very technical field. I mean, a lot of things that we do are relying on uh, incredible computing power. And as such, we have all of that within these centers. You know, we really are very protective of the brand, of the name. If someone is going to interact with us in Milford, they need to have the same care as if they, just, if they chose to drive to Boston. So we probably, you know, we bring all the latest advancements that we possibly can. And we basically have all the same techniques and technologies that we enjoy in town as well. So now, when you look at the kind of patients you treat, mm -hmm. is there a specific organ that monopolizes your practice? Or? Well, I think most community practices, hybrid practices with academics, the majority of folks who are on treatment usually have breast cancer. The number one uh, diagnosis for females is breast cancer. Uh, the second most common diagnosis, unfortunately, is metastatic disease. We know that a lot of different tumors will metastasize to other organs, so we're doing palliative medicine to make sure that we're increasing quality of life, taking away pain. Prostate cancer, lung cancer, um, colon cancer, those are the ones that we see most of. But we're full service in the sense that we can handle lymphomas, or GI tumors, um, essentially anything. Um, but of course, is incidence rates. Um, and you know, the things which are more common, we're gonna see more often. So breast cancer is number one here? It is, most community cancer centers. So we um, direct a lot of the different Dana-Faber Brigham sites, you know, kind of across Massachusetts. And the number one malignancy being treated at any given time is breast cancer, you know, followed closely, uh, usually by palliative or prostate cancer. And prostate cancer being the number one male diagnosis of a cancer. One is in that six right? men. Not lung cancer. No, more men die of lung cancer, unfortunately, but the incident rate is one in six men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer if you go look for it. Now, if we live longer, isn't the, aren't the odds greater that we'll have prostate cancer? Well, it's, age is one of the number one risk factors for it. <laughs> and so they, they say if we make it into our hundreds, we have a t ticking time bomb, okay. that most every man will probably have prostate cancer. But the question becomes, is it indolent? Is it something that needs treatment or not? Right. And I will give you know, the fiber a lot of credit where we're really embracing active surveillance protocols. It's not so much knowing that you have prostate cancer. There's a lot of controversy about PSA screening. The question becomes, when do we need to treat it? And there are times when we don't have to treat prostate cancer, but there are also times when if we don't, there's a high probability of the cancer leaving the prostate, going someplace else in the body and causing a lot of havoc in an individual's life. And I think that's one of the things that people are confused over, is you hear you've got such a slow growing cancer of the prostate. Mm -hmm. You know, you're 70, you get to be old, and you're like, you're probably gonna die from natural causes before the prostate catches up to you. But it's got to be kind of unsettling to people. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that that's um, one of the things that we can offer um, is that we can help answer some of those questions. Um, you know, there are lots of different stages and risk stratifications of prostate cancer and any malignancies. And I think the tricky thing is, you know, you know, should you, one, should you, get PSA screening. That's a conversation that uh, a lot of um, primary care providers are struggling with. Um, 
discussing with their patients. But if, if, they do ha if patients do come in and have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, um, I think that you know, one of the discussions we can have with them is what decision is right for them. Um, do they in fact need treatment? Um, maybe would something else uh, you know, potentially cause them to have um, problems before that prostate cancer? But it's a complicated question and it's a complicated discussion that um, I think I can feel proud to say that we have very good discussions with all of our colleagues and we get together as a team um, and we bring those discussions uh, to the forefront. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know the amazing part for me is if I'm coming in and you know behind door A is death, I don't care what's behind door B. It's got to be better. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you hear people at my age, everybody's nervous that, okay, I mean, let's lay it on the table. Most of the questions were, what's the odds on not being able to have long discussions anymore? You know, will I suffer from ED because of it? And I'm like, seriously? Death? <laughs> Other. If you tell me that I need treatment or I'm going to die, Somehow everything else just does not seem as pressing. Well, it's interesting you mention that, though, because <clears throat> you know, sometimes we know some of the lower cancers we're treating may ultimately not have needed treatment. We will never know because if we treat and we make the cancer go away, we don't know what the opposite would have been or the converse would have been if we did not treat. We don't, you know, sometimes don't know what, how that would have impacted the patient's life. So a lot of what we do is actually focused along, uh, focused along quality of life. How do you minimize erectile dysfunction? How do you minimize when you're looking at surgeries versus, say, radiation incontinence risks? How do you minimize, you know, problems with the bowels with Bowel the bladder? movements that don't work as well yeah. anymore. Yeah, and that's where, you know, we, we are embracing technologies we didn't have that many years ago. And I realize I've been doing this for about 15 years, 15 years now. I've seen an evolution of the going from 3D conformal, so we're trying to shape our radiation beams, but still knowing a prostate is going to move around and we're going to have to treat bigger areas, which is going to have some collateral implications. To IMRT, we're using you know sort of focus beams, which we can shape and we can plan backwards. We want to give X amount of dose to the prostate, but we're very cognizant of how much the dose or dose is going to the normal organs, penile bulb for erectile function, say, bowel, bladder, things that you know are very important. And now you know, at the cancer centers, we're proud that we're using rapid or volumetric technologies, <laughs> where we're using not nine entry points into the body, but 720 entry points. In inverse planning too, so we're saying that we want to give this much dose to the prostate, which we can dose escalate now, but to really minimize the collateral complications, which you know, we're, we're real. Now the, the approach vectors, you're so much finer than you ever were. We have that, but we also have ways to put fiducials with GPSs or you know markers within the prostate, because it turns out the prostate can move about a centimeter in any direction at once per day, and if you're not paying attention to that, either you missed it, which is probably something that a may centimeter? have happened. Wow, yeah, that seems a like a lot of movement. Well, the prostate sits right above the rectum and right below the bladder. You know, mm -hmm. as you move, you know, as the rectum fills and empties, the bladder fills and empties, that can cause the prostate to move around. So before each treatment, we're taking pictures to know exactly where the prostate is before we turn the radiation beam on. We're allowed now to treat with smaller margins to still encompass the tumor, any escape routes of the cancer itself, but to make sure we're you know, maximizing the dose of the areas of interest and to avoid the areas of potential complication. But that's, that's what we center ourselves upon. We're really looking to decrease quality of, or decrease issues which can impact quality of life. But if I take a step back and I say, okay, the PSA controversy, to screen or not to screen, what's the downside of screening? Well, I mean, I think the controversy centers around um, whether you know, the downside of screening is over-treatment right. uh, and the cost to the individual to that. If you have uh, over-treatment, you could potentially have the side effects of treatment when you may not have needed the treatment at all to, you know, cure an indolent cancer that may never cause you a problem. Many people um, die with prostate cancer or other cancers uh, and don't die of it. So that's the major controversy. Um, on over diagnosis slash over treatment. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, there are so many different recommendations out there. Um, there are, I think the question has yet to be answered um, whether or not there actually is a true benefit and what that benefit is in light of the side effects. Um, because one of the challenges with doing studies, especially with prostate cancer, where there's a potentially long 
disease course where people can live a long time with uh, either treated cancer or cancer in the, in the middle of treatment is that um, over that 10 or 15 year span, technology changes and, and we hope improves. Um, and so a lot of the measurements on treatment outcomes and treatment toxicities and treatment has improved over that time span. So um, it's, it's kind of like an, a, a constantly moving target. Um, so some of the things that uh, Dr. Oryer was talking about here about uh, advances in the way that we can shape the radiation beams to treat less normal tissue um, has made you know, great strides over the past 10 years. And that's coupled with the advances in imaging and targeting technologies. Um, and we use that to uh, further decrease the toxicities and side effects from treatment. So I think that it's always important to um, you know, if you, uh, if you do have a diagnosis of cancer, to get opinions from, you know, mul either multiple doctors in the same field uh, and then the different sides of the coin. In cancer, that's usually the surgeon, potentially radiation oncologist, and medical oncologist who give chemo because each person is going to have the most up-to-date information on current side effects, current treatments, and, you know, potentially and things that... Is it safe to say when you talk about, like, prostate cancer, I'm feeling good today. Mm -hmm. I go in. It's yeah. not like I'm symptomatic this way. I'm not right. going to go in and say, uh, Peter, I have this problem. I think I have prostate cancer. <laughs> no, most of the time you will never know. And in fact, with PSA screening, we have a lead time usually of seven years before symptoms will develop. And so you really don't know. Um, and that's always a question. I think that's a personal choice, too. If you're being screened with PSA and the PSA is elevating, we use four as a normal. If it's right. greater than four, do we biopsy or not? Do we look at velocity? But if we do and we find cancer, what cancer are we looking at? Because we have low, high, you know, intermediate risk. It's a spectrum of disease. And we have all these different risk stratifications to figure out, well, maybe this deserves a little more attention than others. But it really goes back to the biopsy because that's still how we diagnose cancer. Elevated PSA usually will lead to a biopsy by a urologist that take 12 cores from the biopsy from the prostate. We'll look under the microscope and kind of get a sense of... Twelve what cores? Yeah, it sounds painful, doesn't it? You're harpooning me 12 <laughs> times? Let me tell you a story. So I used to be in the military, and I used to go, we <laughs> used to have these uh, fiducial markers. They were expensive. So when you would put them in, it was a custody, chain of custody in the military, so they didn't get lost, and I would go and travel with them, and that would now be implanted into the patient. I used to work with an older urologist, a great guy, and he would never, ever use any kind of local numbing. And he'd put these little things in, and we'd do <laughs> biopsies, and, you know, guys on the table are saying, you know, listen, Hello. I know you did six and you're six to go. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to keep going, but one day I went and he was out for about two weeks. He sets up his tray. First thing he did is he numbed the patient. He used anesthesia, a little lidocaine, novocaine type of thing. And I said, you know, Mike, why? What's going on? I had one of these damn things done myself last week. <laughs> He's like, if I could go back over my 40 years, I would change it. And that's what the urologists, honestly, are doing now. They, you know, they're making it a lot less uncomfortable because we have ways to do local nerve blocks in the prostate. So it sounds sort of, wow, that could be uncomfortable. Because when you say you're going to core me twice. Right, or 12 I, times in this situation. If I, or 12 times. I mean, if I remember the map, there's not many entrance, there's not many highways to choose from. Well, that's, uh, you got to talk to your urology buddies about <laughs> that. Yes, yes, because you know, we, we actually put radiation seeds in the prostate, but we don't go through that route. We go through the skin because, you know, we know we're not going to have to transverse, you know, materials, you know, fecal materials and things like that. Oh, okay. And I think, you know, the staying to, there's some uh, movements in this country to look at other ways to biopsy using advanced imaging, guided biopsies. But, you know, standard of care still is to do a, you know, a biopsy through the rectal wall to get to the prostate. And so a lot of guys are scared of that. You know, it doesn't sound comfortable. It seems it's invasive, which I mean, which it is. Seems? Uh, well, it could be. <laughs> it, well, exactly. And I think people shy away. And that's the question, too. So if you're going to get a PSA test and your PSA is elevated, and the next step is that we should biopsy, one has to be prepared to go down that road. Because so that's the only way you're going to know. get back to, if I have a PSA screening, I have a piece of information. <coughs> now I can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. by talking to physicians and, you know, do I nuke it, right. do I chemically treat it, mm -hmm. or do I take a machete and cut it out? Okay, so either I'm going to go surgery, mm -hmm. chemo, or radiation, or nothing. 
Right. And, you know, in chemo, we only use in the advanced settings now, which is just for metastatic disease. So most individuals, because 80% of the diagnosis is of prostate cancer or organ confined, low risk, you know, things that you so have, the world is your oyster. So would you really need chemo? Typically not. You know, on chemo we use for the metastatic or castrate resistant settings, meaning that most cancers start off dependent on testosterone, the male androgen testosterone, so, you know, stuff that, we, you know, guys, we go through puberty, that starts the course through our system. We know that is going to be the kind of the fuel, if you will, for development of prostate cancer and feeding prostate cancer. And so oftentimes the chemical, the chemotherapy, if you will, the chemical thing that we do is really just tricking the body to stop producing testosterone for a period of time for the more advanced prostate cancers. Usually the you know, treatment of choice is going to be radiation, sequence possibly with hormonal therapy, you know, shutting down the testosterone, or surgery. Unfortunately, we still see plenty of individuals who come in with bad disease. And you can play a trick of you know, slowing it down. Unfortunately, prostate cancer went to the bone. It wasn't being checked. It wasn't being surveilled. It just was a presentation of, oh, doc, my arm hurts. And you find out it's a metastatic lesion from the cancer, so the cancer travels to the bone. Prostate cancer left unchecked wants to go to the bone, which is, you know, quite uncomfortable. And we can usually palliate either with just local radiation or giving folks mechanisms, a shot typically, to shut down the testosterone. But that works only for a period of time and it becomes resistant. We call it castrate resistant, meaning that, you know, we make our testosterone in our testicles and before we had a shot, the way you would take away testosterone was to remove the testicles and yeah. thankfully we don't do that any longer. But there I are like chemotherapies, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's what's, it's something where, you know, we sometimes minimize prostate cancer. And I understand that it's expensive and PSAs, are, you know, if we're not screening, we we're not diagnosing it, it, we're not going to find it, we can save money. thinking of A, death. Well, so losing my testicles is not something that I woke up this morning saying, wouldn't that be cool? Right. But, but cool losing my life? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But so, I mean, I think right. that one thing that you're touching on in your reaction to, you know, the biopsy, um, that's a very personal decision. And so when I meet with men and I talk with them about the different options, because for prostate cancer, for most cases, men will have a decision. They, should, they can either have surgery, radiation, or potentially um, surveillance. Um, but, and, and you know, between radiation and surgery, in almost all uh, settings, they're equivalent in terms of the cure rates. Um, but, but the choice comes down to a very personal decision. Um, you know, some people may never want any surgeon cutting them open. Um, they never want to go into the operating room. Um, and other people may never want to have radiation for one reason or another. Um, different, uh, you know, surgery generally takes a few hours in the operating room and then, you know, you have to stay over in the hospital. There's a very specific set of side effects that surgery has that radiation doesn't have and a very specific set of side effects that radiation has that surgery doesn't have. And unless you can talk through those in depth with someone who knows them in depth, um, you really can't make a good, I think you really can't make a, a fully informed decision. But that's the point. I mean, when yeah. you say there are some people um, that don't want surgery, mm -hmm. I don't know anybody. I'd love to have you hack open <laughs> my body, you know, I mean, well, as some, bad as it is, but it's some, the only one I got. But some people who have, who know they have cancer actually do want surgery because I've heard peop many people say, I have a cancer, I want it out of me. Right. And so the only way to get it out of you is surgery. I will not try to convince anyone that radiation will take anything out of you. Uh, we will kill the cancer cells, but we're not going to remove tissue from your body. Um, so that's the one instance where but someone again, would prefer surgery. I can't see anybody <laughs> saying they want chemo, they want radiation therapy. They, no, I don't right. want it. On right. the other hand, I want it less than I want to die. Right. And I think that's, that's what it comes down to. I mean, there's different options, and you need to choose the option which is right for you, but understanding that sometimes that's the only choice we have. It's the cards who are dealt. And we try to you know, help the patients decide, well, what's the, what's the best option for me? Because there are definitely better options for some than others and you know but it's our job as educators to you because i'm happy and i'm looking to go to right. disney i right. tell all my patients the you first thing I, mean? I say i'm sorry you're here to see yeah, me exactly. right. i wish we we're having a cup of coffee i wish you were, we're out not. of business yeah. right. Right. i really nice guys but sure. i wish you guys were out of business but okay deal with reality if i have cancer then let me make an informed decision right. you know when my mom went in for her normal screening <coughs> touch wood 12 years ago they said she had intestinal cancer. Mm, okay. 
Did we want to deal with it? No. If I could do an ostrich and put my head in the sand and it would go away, that would be what I want. But no amount of praying or anything else is going to make it go away. We talked to the oncologists and surgery was recommended. It seemed like the best course of action. Guess what? That was 12 years ago. And mom is, you know, mom is mom. Excellent. God bless her. Good. You know, so you sit there and say, did she want surgery? No. Yeah. You know, when you talk about doing biopsies, no, I don't want you going up there. Nope. <laughs> I can tell you flat out that is not something I want. But I certainly want to know what my options are. That's and if I have to put up with the pain, okay. Well, Matt, that, that brings up a great point, because we do screening clinics all the time, and it's something where, you know, if you're going to have this, if this is what is going to happen in your life by genes, bad luck, or whatever it is, it's just, it's, it's destined for something that one's going to have to deal with, it's much better to know early on, because your treatment option, your cure rates, everything you can do is that much greater, usually with a lot less toxicities, because you can take care of the problem easily. And so, you know, I think we have these, you know, conversations, and right now we have, you know, kind of a swirl in the nation of, you know, to screen or not to screen. And, of course, the timing is we're trying to, we have to be, you know, we have to pay attention to healthcare dollars. We have to make sure that we're petitioning dollars to those who need it, and we spend too much on one thing and not enough on another. You know, recommendations come out. But, you know, to me, I'd much prefer to know I had something which I could deal with versus allowing it to get to the point where there's nothing left to do and be going to the door, which is and not going to be Ben's pleasant. And then to point, you may mentally just say, I need it out. Because, yeah. I mean, you know better than I that the mental uh, health of the patient can really attribute to maintaining their health. Sure. Yeah. So if they sit there and say, okay, surgery is the best thing because then I can feel, it's out of me. Right. I don't have this nasty growth in me. Right. Cool. Yeah. But at least they've had the discussion. You know, what scares me is either A, that people don't want to know. I mean, of course nobody wants cancer. Right. But if I'm destined to have it, I'd li if I'm going to ignore it, I want it to be my decision to ignore. Right. You know, and then you turn around and say, okay, we've got the radiation guys come in. Okay, you got the guys with the laser guns shooting through me, and you got the guys with the seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, if I dare call you seed, seed therapy, somebody said, yeah, then they feel like farmers. And <laughs> <laughs> we sell the seed. <laughs> you, fill, you take your little seeds and you plant them. And I'm like, okay, farming 101. But how do you decide? Well, I mean, I do quite a bit of seeds for the fiber. And it was something that, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. I, I trained out in Seattle, as did Ben, actually. We both uh, spent uh, uh, formative years at the University of Washington with Fred Hutch, and we came back this way. In fact, I'm a bit older than Ben, as you can see, just by my face, but recruited him back to this part of the country, and we're very, very glad he came. Um, but yeah, a lot of what was represented off that way was seed brachytherapy, or putting radiation seeds within the prostate directly. Because don't forget, back in 1984, when this was invented or brought back to this country by a man named John Blasco, who was you know, kind of a you know, mentor of both of ours, the alternatives in radiation weren't all that great. The alternatives in surgery were open, non-nerve sparing. You know, a lot of things were going on, so they were looking for ways to increase quality of life, but also to you know, cure the cancer with the technologies they had. And the advantage at that point was taking a radiation seed, which had a finite throw of radiation. So you have a seed, and it's going to impact radiation to the cancer cells at a very a small distance. small area around the, the tissue. Right. And then you would put all those seeds within the tumor itself, and we've evolved over the past 30 years. In fact, our teams now, we interact with industry to do image guide techniques, and we're you know, really kind of on the head of the, the curve. It's kind of fun to sort of stand on the shoulders of the giants before you to take some technologies and make them that much better, take out the learning curves, make it so that using three-dimensional ultrasounds, you put seeds precisely where they need to go. I mean, it, it's really evolved, but essentially what we could do with a handful of seeds is what the technology that we're using now had to take 30 years to catch up to these, you know, mega linear accelerators at the cost of, you know, 10 millions, you know, millions of dollars, 10 million dollars to do the same thing, which a couple hundred dollars of seeds can do. And so the elegance is its simplicity. But, you know, who is appropriate? Well, then you have to really start to look to see the quality of the, imperson the person implanting. Because seeds can do exactly what can do with a radiation beam, but you have to have a high quality implant. But isn't seed technology more surgeon dependent 
Well, that's exactly it, and that's why we spend so much time with industry, kind of working with different treatment planning systems, and we have doctors come to our ORs all the time, even in Milford, in the sense that we've represented some of the technologies for the country. We released a release um, of this new playing system in Milford Regional, which was kind of a neat thing to do as we associated with the hospital. But essentially what we're doing is we're looking for ways to take some of the dependence out because a surgeon is a surgeon is a surgeon. It's our hands. It's what we can do. And, you know, it's very difficult to quality assure someone's Individual hands. surgeons. Right. And so a lot of what we do, because we want to keep the standards the same between all cancer centers, we work very hard to figure out ways to do everything by image guidance. I mean, basically, I used to fly airplanes. I'm very much checklisted oriented. I like runways to land on, and we have ways that this, the needle will go into the prostate in an image-guided tract. If you're in, you're in. Great. So it Drop sounds the seed. like criteria number one, if I decide on brachytherapy, I want somebody who's planted a lot of seeds. Yeah, well, it's like any surgery, any surgeon. You really want the person who you feel most comfortable with has the skill set that you need at that particular time, and the same thing applies to seeds like anything else. But it seems like a lot more specialized. It's a bit more specialized. There's less radiation oncologists doing brachytherapy, but it, you know, there's still plenty of brachytherapists. We call ourselves brachytherapists doing it. And there are certifications we can achieve and different things of that nature to make sure that we have a high-quality program where we're continuously you know, building upon and learning from and making sure that the quality is reported to others. We do chart rounds in the sense that when we do anything within these walls of these cancer centers, it's just not one individual. We have 40 radiation oncologists as part of the Brigham and Dana, and everything we do is peer-reviewed, meaning that the other doctors look to see that we're doing the correct thing and the outcomes are good. So you take um, some of the variability or some of the practice, if you will, of medicine somewhat out of the equation because you have other eyes on, 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 the, uh, on the case. But when I look at my choice, if I've decided on radiation, I mean, I always think of chemo is a broad blunderbuss. You know, I'm, I'm trying to go all throughout the whole body right. and pick off all these little stragglers that have left the home. Sure. So I can't shoot them all with a rifle. Now my choice is, do I use a rifle right. or do I use seeds? I mean, when I think of peeing, pooping, and saluting <laughs> being the three, you know, three <laughs> things that could, I hate to say it, but yeah, yeah um, compared to death, I'll wear a diaper. Okay, compared to death, I'll <laughs> deal with yeah. not having regular bowel movements. But the beautiful thing is with the technologies and even with the new surgical techniques, having something like that is so remote that you know we don't see that I mean and that's the thing emotionally you know that you know it's terribly sexist and I apologize but old men get worried you know can I pee poop and salute if mm -hmm. you're going to get in the way of that I can't see going to door a but um, is traditional radiation therapy any better worse in effect you know efficacy or side effects? I mean, I, 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 I yeah, start to not have opinions yeah. because we both you know, do a lot of this. Um, you know, it's interesting. So we know that cancer cells require a certain amount of dose to kill. And we mm. call these things log kills, meaning that if you have a million cancer cells, you know, you don't want to leave 100 cancer cells left. You want to kill them all. You want to kill six, lo six log removal. It's like we do with bacteria and cell culture. Exactly. So you just you want to get rid of it all. And we're starting to appreciate that some of the technologies we have are probably enough for some cancers. We can give enough dose or enough kill, but sometimes it needs to be augmented. And so the Canadians actually just uh, published a randomized, well, they haven't published it, they've been presenting it all over the world, and we just did some down in Orlando, where they were looking for higher risk prostate cancer patients, and they were comparing it to beam and taking the testosterone down for a bit right. of time, which we do in high risk um, prostate cancers, with or without a brachytherapy boost or putting the seeds in to augment the dose. Oh. And we're seeing, you know, by these results, about seven years of uh, median uh, follow-up right now, so, you know, healthy, kind of paying attention to the, to the issue, that the PSA staying down and being low, which is that surrogate for doing the right thing, is twice as good. Ben, so meaning that we need probably more dose in some of these particular if cancers. If I turned around and said, side effects be damned, mm -hmm. do I beam or do I seed? How would you answer? So not paying attention to side effects. So I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is that both external beam and brachytherapy seed placement are both radiation. 
Uh, and the side effects, um, they are similar between the two, and it has totally to do with anatomy. Where the prostate sits is right between the bladder and the rectum, and those are your two major organs that get affected. So you're going to have irritation to your urinary system and your rectum. Whether you deliver that externally or by putting seeds into the prostate, you're still going to have those two things affected. You know, there haven't been great studies comparing side effects between the two because no one wants to get randomized to have, you know, needles stuck in their groin um, or lie on a table. Um, you know, there, there are some things that, you know, probably are a little bit better um, with the brachytherapy seed placement. One of those things potentially could be erectile dysfunction, might be slightly uh, less in brachytherapy. Um, but if you're not paying attention to side effects, um, there's a couple things we do look at, and one of the things has to do with um, some of the intricacies of the prostate cancer. Um, how aggressive the cancer is um, may dictate some of that, and brachytherapy more traditionally, at least alone with the seeds, has been used more towards the lower The lower spectrum aggressive disease. end. Lower, less aggressive right. end, yeah. And then as you trend towards the more aggressive, we tend to be, want to cast a slightly broader swath of radiation, which covers a little more area where there's an increased risk that the cancer could have broken a little bit outside of the prostate. Um, that's the one advantage of external beam. Or as Dr. Royer was saying here, um, we potentially combine the two where we give some external beam uh, for about five weeks, and then we add the breaking. That's what I was going to ask yeah. you because you know if you look and you say side effects be danged, which one do I choose? Mm -hmm. But I'm reading that now a lot of the treatments are a combination. Well, I think we're moving in that direction. I think you know a high quality implant is a high quality implant, and I read a lot of the national guidelines. But I can't police and QA every other program in the country, and we know some are better than others. And so essentially what we're trying to do is treat the same prostate with a margin of about five millimeters because there's good studies, a you know, great study of Mayo basically saying if the cancer is going to go past the prostate, it's usually within about a millimeter. So if we try to treat with a five millimeter net, we're probably going to stop in its tracks. Now with, you know, sort of brachytherapy where you put seeds right outside the prostate as we can do when you link them, well, you're getting the same effect because we've really migrated away from treating lymph nodes with prostate cancer. Um, there's been some randomized trials and, you know, the benefit we don't see it being there. So we're not using these big fields that used to, you know, used to treat the bowels. Now we're just draining the prostate similar vesicles, which you can do, and the question always becomes, similar vesicles are these little tubes on top of the prostate. They're basically just storage containers for sperm, and when we have an orgasm, they squeeze down and everything goes out. But with, you know, good techniques, you can actually implant the proximal one centimeter of the seminal vesicle, or if a cancer is going to be there, it's usually there 95% right. of the time. So. You know, granted, with beam, sometimes we augment because you're sort of hedging your bets. Can we treat a little more area, which we know we're, you know, rock solid, that laser sighted guy. A little more is just millimeters. And that's exactly what we're You're not understand. talking, okay, we're going to open it. Um, you know. <laughs> no, and thankfully we don't. I mean, some folks have cancer, which goes to the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes being the safety net, you know, sort right. of they catch different things. And you have to do that. But we're not routinely doing that any longer. And we, you know, we, there were trials and men were randomized. A flip of a coin, should you get this or you should you get that? But I think another thing we have to pay attention to is, you know, external beam radiation is 44 treatments Monday through Friday. Sure, you're in the cancer center for only about 20 minutes per day, but it is a Monday through pro Friday proposition. Now, if you have a job where you're traveling in the rural, to be stationary for nine weeks may become difficult, whereas the seed implant is one day. You go to the hospital in the morning, and about three hours later you go home. But, you know, as you know, Dr. King and, you know, was saying there's a different side effect profile. So over a nine week course, you might manifest some urinary, I pee more often, oh, she said, get up to go, and oh, wow, I gotta go now. I've got some, you know, where's the bathroom? Yeah, watch out, I gotta go. With the seeds, you're basically, you know, in that one day procedure, you're buying that symptom complex for four to six to eight weeks after the implant. So there's no free lunch. And that's what, you know, Dr. King with Ben and I, we, we do all the time. We're talking about what are the, what's the cost? Because nothing, there's no free again, lunch in the world. If I gotta put up with something, when I was stupid playing hockey and I broke my leg, they had to put rods and screws. I did not like that. But that was what I had to put up with so I could have a normal, right. an old man's normal leg after that. You know, if I've got to deal with, you know, urinary problems for nine weeks, you know, oh my God, that's terrible. Okay, door number A right. keeps looking at me saying, okay, I can live, I love that word, I can live for nine <laughs> weeks with pretty much anything. Well, that's exactly, and they're just irritative symptoms. They're not quality of life, oh my yeah. gosh, you know, I, I can't live. It's, hmm, it's different, but yes. you know, it's not horrific. It's annoying. And I mean, I think that's the thing that we always have to impart 
you know, as we do these shows and we talk, it's something where there's a lot of fear. You know, there's a fear of diagnosis, a fear of this and this fear of that. And, you know, a lot of our task force, because we're trying to ratchet down the amount of men we screen, the primary doc is having a conversation. Hey, Mr. Jones, do you or do you not want a PSA test? If we do a PSA test and it's elevated, we might have to do a biopsy. There's a high probability the biopsy will be negative, but we're going to make you go through the biopsy anyway because we're now lulled down this you know, sort of path that we now have to cross all our T's and dot all our I's. But having a simple blood test may be something a you know, person would say, yeah, I just want to know. Right. And it doesn't mean you're buying the biopsy. You know, oftentimes it's going to be low, but if it's high, maybe one would want to find out why it is or to do some serial testing, see if the, prost the PSA is moving around, is it going back down to normal, because you can elevate prost um, PSA from riding a bicycle. Anything that's putting pressure on the prostate, and we basically sit on our prostates, if you will, can cause sometimes some elevation. So I think the question becomes when, you know, we're putting a lot of onus on our patients, and I, I like it and I don't like it at the same time sure. because, you know, we, we, you know, Dr. King have, and I have this conversation all the time. Well, doctor, you went to medical school. You tell me. If you want me to do something for you, <laughs> that's my specialty, and I will take care of it, but I'm coming here to ask you a question. And so I just I think it's always important to empower you know, individuals that, yes, you're going to have this, you're most likely going to have this conversation with your primary, and it's going to come in your court to say yes or no. And you know, what is the cost of saying yes? Yes, you might have an elevated PSA. It doesn't mean you have to interact with it. Or okay. you might have a normal PSA and you have a peace of mind. You may catch a cancer before it becomes problematic. And I mean, it's difficult. Obviously, personal choice. Obviously, there's financial implications and a governmental level as we partition our resources. But if it was me, I much prefer to know I'd so I don't have know. to go through the door that's, you know, kind of a not a good death. So now we focus on prostate cancer. I mean, me, I'm an old man. That's in my mind. But I'm reading cervical cancer is really becoming a l growing area for brachytherapy. Yeah, well, it used to be the mainstay of treatment, and you know, we were chatting before. I'm on the I'm a director uh, of the American Board of Brachytherapy, so we really pay attention to brachytherapy. But is it growing or is it going down? Well, the use is going down because you know we have these interesting technologies. So I remember having this conversation when I was in residency many years ago with a very very well established uh, GYN or cervical cancer radiation oncologist, and I said, you know, I, we can see sort of the future. We see where we're going to be going. We're going to be much more targeted, and we're going to be able to give a lot more dose using techniques where we don't have to scrub and go to the OR and put devices inside of a woman's body. And he said, no, Peter, that would never happen because the dose we can give with cervical brachytherapy is going to always be so much higher because when you look at the physics, and a lot of what we do is just math and sure. physics, we're the geeks of the doctors, I suppose, is so, so, so much higher. But, and it's interesting, we just wrote an editorial, it just got picked up for publication, and I'm putting this Royal Congress of Brachytherapy together in San Francisco in 2016, where the whole world is gonna descend upon us, and we're gonna talk about these different issues. But in this country alone, we're seeing a decreased utilization of cervical brachytherapy because it's harder to do, it takes more time, physician has to you know, have the setup, the apparatus, go and do it, which is, you know, takes some effort and skill set versus contouring the cervix and trying to use these external technologies, which are pretty amazing, but are we giving enough dose? Because it goes back to when we're talking about the prostate. Sometimes you need more dose. Cervical cancer, sometimes you need a and lot I more dose. Now, I also read that there's high dose and low dose brachytherapy. Right. Is there a time when you choose one or the other? Well, for cervical cancer, low-dose brachytherapy is pretty much... It's all you get. No, it's pretty much... It, no. We don't no. use it in this country because that was when we'd put these radiation sources to a woman's cervix. They'd be in the hospital bed for 18 hours, immobilized, couldn't move around. You'd have risks of having clots or these little problems in your legs. And the exposure to the individuals putting it in were real. I mean, Ben and I used to get exposed to radiation sources as we were putting these things into you know, human bodies. Now we have high dose, which is basically a catheter where the patient is in a controlled room, shielded, so there's no exposure to personnel. Oh, okay. And this little radiation source goes into multiple channels, so it goes into the body and it comes back out, so it's never implanted in. So high dose rate is when you take a radiation source, you let it dwell. Expose the expose tissue. Expose it and then bring it pull back. Pull back. But now you're doing that from a shield. Yeah. yeah because it's a, it's a significant exposure. Now, if it's controlled near cancer, it's fine. But if Ben and I were in that room all the time as that's happening, our exposure risk Well, it's like the x-ray technicians. It always spooks people when they're not going to be in the room. <laughs> well, yeah, because I'm getting one hit. Right. 
if they're doing 100 a day, they could be well done by the end of the day, you know, because of the cumulative effect. That's the thing. We, I don't know if my, we have our badges on, but we <laughs> wear exposure badges because we do have some exposure to radiation, and we have these set limits of what we deem to be normal or safe over a period of a year. And, you know, truly, if you were to expose yourself 100 times a day, you can quickly reach that limit. And so we have all the safety and shielding, so we don't, because we have a lot of staff to protect as well. You know, it's not just a physician, but we have radiation therapists, we have physicists, we have a lot of individuals, this huge brain trust, and it's really something that takes a village to do this stuff right. And we have to make sure they're safe as well. No, I mean, you don't want to expose a nurse, a technologist, right. you know, in a way that brings their health down. I mean, I'm glad you're treating right. as a patient. I'd be happy you're taking care of me, but I really don't want to see you being exposed. Well, that's exactly it. And, you know, there's that whole tenet of emergency medicine or the, you know, EMTs that protect us all the time, and they're the first into our scene to, you know, help us get to a hospital in, in the case of an accident. But the first thing we, you know, we teach the medics is don't go into an unsafe environment because if you're now hurt, you can no longer help anybody else. And these are those same tenets apply, that we have to make sure that the exposures are basically zero. We strive for zero. We pretty much achieve zero. But you have to be very cognizant and pay attention to them because... If you don't, well, then you're going to be exposing to some, someone, something to somebody that they shouldn't be exposed to. But now, if I look at prostate cancer, if I have to have one of the cancer family, you know, most people say, okay, that's the one I, w I don't want any, but if I have to let one in the door, right. I mean, cervical yeah. cancer, a different animal. It is. I mean, I think we should, you know, Ben can talk to this too. We, we, know, we know cervical cancer, a lot of them are, um, and this is actually a good topic for people to understand. A lot of cervical cancers are caused by a virus, this human papillomavirus, HPV, v. you know, 16, 18. And it's basically sexually transmitted. I mean, any time that virus can go from one place to another, it can go. And we have vaccinations now that we're trying to get into, you know, younger people before they become sexually active. And unfortunately, in our society, you know, maybe it's getting a little earlier and earlier and earlier. The utilization rate of these vaccinations, which theoretically have a high probability of preventing a lot of the cervical cancers we see, aren't being utilized the same rate would want because that's a very awkward discussion, unfortunately, by the physician who's talking to mom or dad about a young child who, you know, should not, in their mind, the be doing the what day, they're you're doing. talking about, you know, as an old man, I've always said, mm -hmm. if I could keep this fantasy alive, that my sainted mother <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, you know, my offspring were asexual, events like Hiroshima <laughs> would be a minor inconvenience <laughs> to the afternoon tea. <laughs> You know, I mean, there, yeah. I can deal with a lot of things, right. but you're telling me my daughter who's moving into teens, right. I've got to deal with her having long discussions with somebody I don't know? I can see the emotion. I can see it, but to ignore it in today's day and age. Well, that's putting your head in, your, in the sand, and you probably shouldn't. And I know there's a lot of, you know, sort of discussions, and people will disagree on various points, but you have something which can probably prevent something bad from happening. The unfortunate thing is this virus is very prevalent. You know, most individuals have it. And, you know, it can be it's passed, not but there's not that subtypes. There's a you subtype went to Bangkok and you went into a place that yeah. you know. No, it's in America. Yeah. It's here now. And can we do something to prevent it? And that's what we really, that's the discussion we should be having. It's a very difficult discussion to have, though, for, you know, for the, the families, for the physicians, because you're basically saying, I'm giving you something which may protect you from getting a bad disease, if you have sex, and I'm yeah. going to offer this to you way before we think Number you're old enough one, to do it. Just say, no, don't. Okay, <laughs> now let's get to reality. Well, that's the problem. You right? know, the majority yeah. of the kids are going to be sexually active. You know, I mean, when we were children, we never drank. Of course not. <laughs> we never did bad things. We were angels. <laughs> that's true. Okay, let's get over that fantasy. No, my mother will tell you the same thing yes. to this day. Yeah, it's like an angel. I tell my wife, my daughter went to Holy Cross. They don't drink. Sunday morning when we went up there and my daughter was moving slow, she must have been in the library real late last night studying. <laughs> now let me get to reality. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, if you think about it, part of growing up, unfortunately, is making silly decisions. Right. And if they hook up with somebody, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, the tattooed bike rider, you know. Very true. It could be normal Johnny football player or Sally the cheerleader. And one time. Right, if you get that serotype or that subtype, that potentially could be, it's a one-time event. It's a one-time right. shot. Right. 
and there's nothing you can do at that point. You got it. Right. So not doing the vaccine again, I think it's, to me, I hate to say it because I'm putting a lot of burden on the um, primary care physician. Or the pediatrician. Or the pediatrician. Yeah. Yep. You got to be able to be honest and have an open discussion in a closed room because mm -hmm. they'll never violate your trust. They're not going to go tell your neighbors, right. you know, Peter's daughter must be active because he's talking to me. Right. Well, and that's the thing. You know, I think sometimes, too, we have to understand that, you know, when the, you know, a woman comes to you know, the proper age, they can ask their parents to leave as well if they need to have this conversation. If people are watching this and it's something that, well, maybe I should be thinking about doing that, maybe I want a private conversation with my, doc my doctor. It's much easier to talk. You know, there's, a, there's obviously a confidential confidentiality with physicians, as we all know, and you know we don't violate that trust. I mean, you know, it's something where if something needs to be said, it's said within those closed doors, and it's not broadcasted, and no one's going to know. I mean, we you know we, we think about chickenpox, and I've got young children will probably never have chickenpox because they had vaccinations. It was a rite of passage for myself and my right. sister, and I mean everybody in this room. But it's something which we've eradicated. And the fantasy or the hope is that we start to get a prostate vaccination, which is in development and they're working, they're trying various things. But just imagine something that we know one in six guys is probably going to be diagnosed with. And if you live long enough, maybe everybody, every right. man, if we just stop it in its tracks. Well, it's like being diabetic. They say if we live to 120 years, we're all going to be diabetic at one point. Well, we wear out, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're in tear. We, we weren't meant to live forever. Whatever right happened to wrong. craftsmen? You know, that <laughs> department. I want to order a new organ. <laughs> you know, when I tore my ACL, so. I had my discussion with our service fingers, and it was like, you got a choice. They can cut part of a tendon and make a new ACL, mm -hmm. or they can use a cadaveric ACL. I said, well, when it comes time to do that surgery, go kill a young one. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got enough old men's parts in me. Well, I don't know. Come on now. <laughs> I like a young one. Because that way at least I'll have one young man's part. Now, the yeah. other area that obviously you said is one of the biggest uh, incidents is breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And we've got a one heck of a program here in Milford, don't we? Yeah, we do. And actually, if you want to talk a little bit about what we can do with the IDH and things like that? Yeah, I think um, one interesting thing about breast cancer and one thing we've been talking about a lot is that um, there's so many new technologies that we have both within radiation itself. So specifically for breast cancer, um, you know, the cure rates, depending on the stage, can be very good uh, with a localized surgery uh, followed by radiation and potentially hormonal therapy. Um, but as technology has improved and imaging has improved, um, one of our main goals uh, over the past you know, five to 10 years has been decreasing normal tissue that we're treating and therefore aiming to decrease the side effects, uh, both short and long term. Uh, so some of the things that we're doing here in Milford are um, using what's called a deep breath technique, uh, where um, since we're treating the breast with radiation, um, we'll usually come in with a couple of beams. One comes from this, one si this side and one comes from this side. Um, if it's a left-sided cancer, Unfortunately, the heart lies pretty to close the to the breast, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there's something that lies in between those two organs, uh, and that's the lung. And so um, the idea behind deep breath inspiration is that we have uh, women take a deep breath and hold it, and that inflates the lungs, and it moves the breast away from the heart, and therefore we can treat uh, the breast and avoid the heart. Um, we're only able to do this because we have um, good imaging techniques uh, to visualize exactly where the heart is, and we have very precise radiation delivery techniques uh, and make and quality assurance, making sure that you know what we think we're delivering, we're actually delivering. Um, so that's something that's definitely been spearheaded, uh, and we're proud to offer that at uh, Brigham Dan Farber. Um, the other thing that you were touching on the differences between or the advances between low dose rate and high dose rate brachytherapy. Um, you know, I think for prostate cancer, um, the implants that uh, Dr. Oreo does here in Milford are low dose rate. Um, but um, if, you know, for, for one reason or another, high dose rate, um, maybe, you know, what the, what the patient wants or maybe seen to be advantageous, we could potentially offer that to the patient as well um, through the direct ties that we have uh, with uh, Dana-Farber Boston. And mm -hmm. a lot of times Dr. Oreo will also go in on those cases and perform those cases with uh, the doctors in Boston. So, um, 
we really have uh, so much of technology available both directly, either directly here in Milford or due to our direct ties uh, and, you know, and daily interactions with all the boss, uh, Boston Dana-Farber doctors as well. So um, those are some of the really yeah. interesting new technologies. I can tell you it made a huge difference um, to my mother. You know, she was 70-some years old when she was treated, or seven, almost 80. Hmm. And not having to go to Boston, being able to go to her local hospital, where she's always gone since I was born, mentally was easier for her. Not being in a car fighting traffic to get to Boston, she arrives at the medical center in a good frame of mind. But I, I gotta give credit, you know, to the house that, you know, Uncle Frank and Ed and Uncle sure. Phil have built. Right. Because as my mother says, Dr. Mona, always there. She said the same oncologist. Yeah, and Amoda Candis is a yeah. you know, pill of the community, there's no doubt. But there's so many people in the Milford Medical Center. Well, that's the appreciation. I mean, we understand that you know, going to and from Boston can be very difficult in the best of circumstances. And if you're sick, it becomes that much more difficult to deal with the irritations of traffic, people who are busy and moving around and cutting you off because you know, they need to get to a meeting you need to get to your life-saving therapy. Right. But they don't know who's in that car. It's anonymous. We know that. And I think hopefully that makes us a little better, though, because we appreciate the fact that someone next to us might have an issue when we're trying to navigate that. But we brought all this stuff out to the community with the same level of care, knowing but that you can't have everybody go in. About the Milford Medical Center, when I see so many physicians who are so, if they were the low-end performers, mm -hmm. okay, they can't get a job anywhere else. They're here. But it's not. You see incredibly high quality physicians, and they've been here for decades. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what makes this place special. But I think it was the vision of the leadership, knowing how they would have to evolve with the times to build, to stay independent. Because we have to understand that, I mean, a lot of hospitals like a Milford have been bought up or have closed. To stay and grow, I mean, you see what they're doing over there with the new emergency room and the ICUs. If and I this call is it the Taj Mahal Hopkins, Jeff gets mad. Yeah, I mean, but absolutely you, you start beautiful. thinking of, for a little town, 50 plus million dollars. And it's so exciting that the community's kicking in sure. 25. It's, it's, a, it's a community hospital built by the community and people who are vested in love. Yeah. The place, the hospital, I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. Even when we go into the ORs and do our thing in the ORs, state of the art. I mean, unbelievably good. There's nothing that they don't have in those operating rooms that you can get anywhere else. So now, of 100 patients that come to you, how many do you treat in Milford versus sending to Binney Street or, you know? Well, I think it has to be what it is. I mean, some of the uh, leukemias and blood-borne diseases that probably, and my mother, unfortunately, had to do this herself, are uh, better served at, you know, sort of a center of excellence for a lot of support because when you have a leukemia and you're not building your blood products and you, you, you bleed I mean, you don't have any way to stop it. A lot of bad things can happen. Those acute phases have a window of time where you want the best of everything in the sense, not the best physicians because there are great physicians here as well as there. But isn't it just but experience? But access to chemicals which are very yeah. difficult to have everywhere. Or you have people who specialize in that. They're just yeah. like brachytherapy. You're saying you don't want somebody who plant seeds once in a blue moon. Right. I want a real seeder, <laughs> somebody who's doing this all the time. Sure. For those rare cases. We have, we, there's a, we have a mechanism to bring them into town instantaneously. As we have a mechanism for you know, some of the things which can be well served to be treated anywhere in town if one chooses or out of Milford, they can go from town to here and almost same day assume treatment here because of the way all the records so are So out of 100 patients, how many do you think <coughs> you send off? For radiation oncologists, probably maybe five, if that, maybe. Um, you know, there's some complicated things. The one thing that we don't treat right now is pediatrics, mm -hmm. you know, so less than 18. So we do see, unfortunately, some of these, you know, pediatric malignancies, wow. which we feel a center of excellence like Children's Hospital sure. with the different technologies and, you know, different specialists and, you know, so operating you're only on batting a child 95 percent? <laughs> and probably better, <laughs> because again, we, we're talking about what do we mostly treat? What do we see the most of? Breast cancers and prostate cancers. Yeah, but 95 percent. You can take care of 95 percent of our mothers, fathers, kids right here in town. Absolutely, and we can guarantee that the other 5 percent who might be better served are going to have a direct highway 
and access to some of the best individuals who are subspecialized in that one particular site. Right. So we have folks who, you know, say general urinary oncology where that's the bladder, testicles, penis, prostate. We have folks, all they do is bladder cancer. That's it. They don't see anything else. They're so sub, sub, sub specialized. Now, there are some times when that you're best served to have or even opinion, and we, we facilitate those different relationships. Oftentimes, the technical component of what needs to be done, what radiation can be served out here just as well as in town. But weighing in with you know, world experts is something which wow. I think separates these cancer centers from a lot of other centers in the world. We have, it by email or a phone or a click of a button or on our cell phones, we can talk to, and we're part of them, but part talk to some of the leading minds in research and in cancer delivery in the entire world. And that's something truly special to get linked into. And I think sometimes we, minim we, uh, we don't think of that because we just assume, well, Dana Farber, we have this beautiful cancer center here in Milford. But it's really the link. It's the, it's the hub. It's a spoke to get back to all the technology, to all the brain trust, all of the individuals, because a name is a name. It's the people who make the name. And we have access to all those people, and that's what our patients are privy to. More so here than you know, many other cancer centers really in the world, which it's truly special. And I think it, you know, Dr. King and I, we enjoy working in that environment. It's well, stimulating. I would say it starts with the ability to have the discussions. Right. You know, we talk about things like you get to an age, they want to do colonoscopy. And they look at it and say, you want to put a VCR where? <laughs> right. You want to drive around where? Right, right. You know, I'm sorry, that does not sound like something that I want. Mm -hmm. Well, of course you don't. But the fact that I could have that discussion, now I got a better chance at having an informed opinion. Right. You know, and it's whether to vaccinate for HPV. Mm -hmm. It's a very personal issue. It's nice that you can have that discussion here in town. Right. When they called me and said, we're not absolutely certain right now, but we can tell you high degree of probability your mother has intestinal cancer. That's probably the biggest shock. This is my mother, my sainted mother. Right. Do what you want to me, but this is my mother. Being able to talk to oncologists in my own little town, having discussions with options just meant so much. So our hats are off. Thank you for coming to the center of the universe. Thank you for staying. <laughs> and as always, here. information is the key. The biggest thing that you can do is be informed. Make a decision whether you want to be screened or not, whether you want to do a treatment or not. Have the discussion with your physician so that you do know the options. As always, to our six loyal viewers, Good night. Thanks for watching. May tomorrow be a better night than tonight. God bless and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.